Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to our Terrace IP with Kurt Schuler, who's going to talk today about the different safety standards in automotive. So, Kurt, there are three different safety standards in automotive, and people tend to get confused about them. What are they? Well, there's, there's three standards for kind of when we're dealing with kind of the digital logic design, which is, which is where my company, our Terrace IP, uh, works. Uh, the, the first standard that, that most people in the system on chip industry are familiar with is ISO 26262. That's a, the functional safety standard. Um, there's a newer standard, it's ISO PASS 21448, that's uh, safety of the intended functionality, and that covers a different domain than ISO 26262. And now there's a, a new one, another new one, uh, UL 4600, and that comes out of uh, Phil Koopman's lab at uh, Carnegie Mellon University and Underwriters Laboratory, and that covers a separate set of, sa uh, of uh, safety activities. So there's at least three standards from a, a a digital logic design standpoint that people are asking us questions about. Is one not good enough to cover all of them or does each one really take a completely different slice of things? Uh, they, they take different views of things. I, I would say that, you know, we, we diagram this out a little bit more, but, you know, ISO 26262 is traditional, you know, electronics uh, functional safety. So uh, we're talking there uh, systematic errors, designing stuff in wrongly or manufacturing issues, or uh, on the other hand, random errors that occur, cosmic rays, ionization, all that good stuff. Uh, SODIF and UL4600, uh, those are meant to cover uh, different things, more on the, the process and the thought process of safety. So let's drill down into this. Sure, let's go do it. So Kurt, ISO 26262 was the first of these standards, right? It was the functional safety version? Correct. And um, what we're talking about with ISO 26262 is kind of what I call the traditional um, functional safety. So it's derived from the IC 61508 uh, specification, which covers all uh, electric electronic systems. And what we're dealing with here is uh, systematic errors. and random errors. So these are the issues that you know, think of this as, you know, hey, there's bit flips going on here, or we made an error in the specification, or there was an error that occurred in manufacturing up here. These are the traditional functional safety um, concerns that ISO 26262 covers. Where would something like the drift of a sensor as it ages, where would that fit in? So that's one of the things, and, and this led to the discussion of, hey, should we have a separate specification? So when it came to, if you look at all these new sensors, this is very deterministic and very easy, I wouldn't say easy to analyze, but you can quantify the analysis of this pretty easily. When you're talking those types of sensors, and you're talking not only that, but environment that changes, physical environment that changes, um, that's when the discussion uh, in the ISO 26262 working groups uh, came into being for, hey, do we need to have a separate specification that helps cover uh, dealing with those kinds of things? That was sort of a vague standard when it first came in though, right? And it almost didn't get approved. Correct. You know, the, the idea behind it um, is, is meant to address, initially it was meant to address the issues with these sensors and kind of the non-deterministic behavior of the sensors. Uh, nowadays, you know, as time has gone, there's more non-deterministic processing, you know, machine learning, AI going on. So similarly, uh, safety of the intended function is, is starting to encompass some of that. But there's a lot of disagreement because, um, you know, I, I tend to look at this sometimes as, you know, well, this is for what you do if you didn't you get your requirements right for your system. That's my uh, little bit cynical uh, description of, of what, what SODIF covers. So UL4600 is the newest one of these. What does that entail? Well, uh, UL4600 is pretty interesting. It's, it's very new. Um, it comes out of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Professor Phil Koopman over there, who's kind of one of the fathers of autonomous driving. And if you think about it, you know, ISO 26262, when it was done, you know, everything initially with the 2011 version, there was the assumption that a driver would be grabbing the wheel eventually when something bad happens. In 2018, the new version, we said, hey, you know, that might not be right. You know, the, there might not be a driver in the future. How do we deal with that? You hear terms like fail operational and things like that. Um, as we go to 21448, 
we're dealing with the sensors, the non non-deterministic um, issues with that. And then, oh, the processing, because we're starting to take in over more of the driver's brain and putting that into the computer. In UL4600, it's, it's, they came up with that with the assumption that eventually things are gonna be totally autonomous. And so what happens is, um, you know, as they looked into this, they said, hey, what are some of the big issues with this at the system level? And how we define uh, safety criteria and safety goals uh, wasn't necessarily explicit enough uh, uh, to be useful and actionable. So what UL4600 does, it provides guidance on how to specifically um, state uh, what your safety concept is for, for, for different uh, parts of your system. All of these standards seem to be in a state of almost constant evolution, right? They come out with a, a version and then you revise it the next year. What's driving that? The pace of technological change. And so what's happening is a few different things. So um, as technology is changing, it is totally morphing uh, and, and restructuring uh, the automotive industry. So if you look at uh, some of the big car companies, you know, BMW, you know, known for engines, right? Now, all of a sudden, electronics are super important because everything's becoming more electrified, whether it's hybrid or, or uh, pure electric. Um, but you're also seeing um, more and more technology in the human machine interface and ultimately going to autonomous driving. And so the technology, it's, it's morphing the industry. It's also causing societal concerns because, hey, you know, as these cars have more and more autonomy, they're interacting with the rest of us. You know, how do we deal with that? And how do we know as we add more and more uh, capabilities to these systems, whether it's on the sensor side or the thinking side, um, how do we know when we add those capabilities that they're going to work? Is there any overlap between all of these? Uh, yes, there, there is. Um, you know, I, I think there's more of a demarcation here between ISO 26262 and these other two specifications. Uh, but as you get over here, I think SOTIF is expanding to cover some of the, hey, here's some of the guidance on how to define, um, you know, safety goals and safety requirements, safety concept, whatever you want to call it. Um, and both of these have some thought process for, you know, have you thought about this? 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 Um, I would say SOTIF has is, is probably up to now been a little bit more philosophical. I think UL4600, um, uh, the, the intent with the current draft, I think is to be more explicit and, you know, almost have a checklist of have you thought about these different things and what kind of risk mitigation are you going to have for that? You have an awful lot of uh, things to worry about as you start developing these chips. Um, do you now have to almost have a checklist for each one of these? Well, it's, uh, there are checklists and confirmation checklists, if you will. That's the term we use in ISO 26262 to say, hey, you know, have you looked at these things? Where is your evidence of these things? So for semiconductor vendors, you know, how, how, I, how I explain it to people is for semiconductor vendors and for IP vendors who aren't doing a complete system, you're going to spend more time focusing on ISO 26262. Uh, you're most likely a safety element out of context. You, ha you have to make a lot of assumptions about what's going on at the system level. But bottom line, you don't know how people are going to use your, your CPU or your memory controller, in our case, our interconnect. So this is most actionable for us. However, you have to be cognizant that your customer and your customer's customer is looking at things from a system level and is integrating your stuff um, in a broader, uh, you know, sense, decide, actuate system. And, you know, understanding the terminology, understanding their concerns for dealing with these two specifications, I think will become more important over time. However, actionability for what we do on a daily basis is still primarily focused on ISO 26262. And really what you take all three of these together, what you're defining here are best practices for developing systems for the, for the autom automotive industry, right? Exactly. What you're trying to do here is say, hey, have we thought about, you know, everything that's, that's reasonable and foreseeable uh, with these systems? And that's very, very difficult to do. But having a, thought pro a structured thought process around it allows us to look back two, three, four, five years later when the car's actually on the road after you designed it and to be able to say, yeah, okay, we thought about that. We, you know, you had this bad thing happen, but you know, that wasn't foreseeable. We weren't thinking that way at the time. Here's everything we did think about. So it helps reduce your liability over time.
So you think about cars before they had all the electronics that they have today and were they going to have even more electronics in the future. Was this kind of, of uh, liability type of approach and regulation still in place even then? Yeah, the thought process or, or the way it was at, um, implemented within the different geographies for you know the automotive supply chains was exactly that. You had to have some kind of commercial way to deal with the liability issues within the supply chain. Um, and the way was to say, okay, you know, what are the best practices? What's the state of the art? And how do we document that and give that up? What's happening now within automotive supply chain, though, is it's given a much more detailed level because we're going down from, uh, a, you know, we're not just talking mechanical parts. Uh, we're going down you know, to the bit level sometimes on some of these chips and discussions going between tier ones and semiconductor vendors or IP vendors. Hey, how did you do this? How do you protect for this? So it's a totally different thing. And what's happening is, you know, people are having to work much more tightly together. Um, but the, the purpose of this is, yes, it's to make the systems better, but it's also to limit the liability for everybody in the value chain. Kurt Schuler, thanks for a great explanation. Hey, thank you, Ed.